three, two, one. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, the Lo-Fi Horror Guy. Welcome to another episode of the Lo-Fi Horror Guys Growing On Your Life. Today, we are going to be having on the one and only Kurt Brecht, DRI, Pasadena Napalm Division. Oh my God, I cannot wait. This is going to be so, so sick. Uh, this is this is going to be cool. I, I'm really excited for this one here. Uh, first and foremost, I got to say that this episode is sponsored by the one and only Studio House Designs. Well, bam, uh, the purveyors of horror and VHS nostalgia bring you guys the coolest vintage inspired horror movie tie dyes along with long sleeves. And you know what I'm saying? The legendary VHS stack t shirts. Bringing you guys these. Uh, very, very cool. Find them at uh, the studiohousedesigns.com as well on Instagram at studiohousedesigns. So, we're going to get my dude, uh, like I said, Kurt Brecht is going to be the guest for today's show. I'm going to get my man here. Boy, on started. Let's see here. Get it connected. Kurt, what is going on, man? <laughs> Awesome. What's up, man? We got it figured out. Yeah, it, that, that's all good. Modern that's technology. It. Isn't that something? <laughs> Wild. Well, look, man, first and foremost, let me say thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, this is huge. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, here on Growing On You Live, basically, we have a couple of icebreaker questions. First off, the remainder of the interview is about you and your craft, your career uh, with the bands you've been in. And then I have one finale that I wrote just for you, my man. All right. All right, if you're all comfy and you're all set in, we're going to get this bad boy started then. Let's do it. All right, hit me up with, you know, my wife and I do some traveling. If we were coming through even the, the Houston, maybe even Pasadena area, what's a local eatery, uh, a local food staple that we'd have to try according to you before we leave? What would we have to try? Uh, there's two. One would be barbecue. Yeah, of course. Good Texas barbecue. Uh, no okay. shortage of places to find that. And the other is Mexican food. We have really good Mexican food here. Oh, shit. Okay. Any, any restaurants in particular? Yes. Uh, let's see. Some of these Mexican restaurants, they have a separate bar, and that has a separate name. So okay. let me think for a second. Um, yeah, there's a Mexican place called Lorenzo's. Nice. A chain. Nice. Huge portion. Oh, okay. Good food, kind of fancy Mexican food, but giant proportions. <laughs> nice, nice. Large you get some good food, food, you get a nice yeah. beer. Yeah, as well. Margaritas Sick. and beer. Right, awesome. You can't go wrong with that. I mean, you know, even if, if, the, if the, the food's, you know, slightly mediocre, a good beer can, can help out anything. <laughs> 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 all right let, let me ask you here you know as far as with with quarantine kind of keeping us all locked up if you had the opportunity to start a, a dream side project you know something where you were just making one album and you could make a, a band with any other three members who would be in your band dang that's tough um well i, I haven't worked with a lot of other people mm-hmm Dave Grohl's the only one I really worked with besides yeah. the guys in DRI. So I guess I'd have to throw him in there. Nice. He could play any of the instruments or sing. So mm -hmm. I could utilize him however I want. <laughs> 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 just me and him would be fine. He just, he, he could Damn. play everything. Damn. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Just throw something together. You can scream over his, you know, shenanigans, whatever he comes up with. Yeah. Love it. That's sick. All right. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So, Tell us about your, your musical interests, you know, in your youth. What, you know, when you were younger, what were some initial songs or maybe even albums that really, you know, right. draw, drew your attention? So from what I remember, I went straight from listening to kids records, you know, like from uh, animated movies and stuff like that to Black mm -hmm. Sabbath, you know, just going over to my brother's <laughs> really? friend's house or whatever, or Janis Joplin and Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. So I, I just switched straight from kid stuff to that, the Beatles. And the Beatles had some almost kid-like songs, you know what I mean? Like Yellow Submarine, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Kids so like that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I got into that, but quickly went to the heaviest stuff that was available at that time, <laughs> Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, et cetera. Okay. And it was a it was an older brother of yours that was introducing you to the stuff. Older, yeah, the records they had laid around them and their friends. Oh, okay, nice, nice. And 
So j that just kind of drew your attention right off the bat as far as with, with Black Sabbath. And you mentioned Deep Purple as well. Right. Nice. nice. Okay, sweet. When, you know, when you were coming up as far as, you know, with, with, with venues, you know, for you to go to shows or concerts, what were some, you know, what were some, some memorable early on venues that you would attend uh, concerts? Well, when I first started going to shows, there was no punk. So right. I was, the venues where, where we would go were not bars. They were um, coliseums and stadiums right. where you see multiple bands that were radio play rock bands. You know, mm -hmm. mostly. What were some of so the earlier go, concerts you went to? Uh, like UFO, Rush, with Van Halen opening. Those were some of the first I went to. <laughs> um, after that, you know, Ted Nugent come through like every year. Saw Led Zeppelin play, Black Sabbath multiple times, Alice Cooper, Blue Oyster Cult, all that kind of stuff. Anything coming through town that was that was heavy. <laughs> exactly. Nice. I love it. Do you have any sort of record stores that you know uh, that come to mind from when you were young that you would attend that you you know that really uh, maybe even something just local to you that you loved? Yeah. So there there was a mall not too far from my house and a shopping mall and back then they all had record stores <clears throat> in the mall. So. I had a job ever since I was 14 years old. So each week after I got my check, I would go to the mall and check out whatever new records were there and try to buy one. Okay. Nice. And, and, and I don't even remember the name of that. It was just a big box store. But then when, um, when those, when punk became popular, there was a, a punk rock record store that I knew of. Oh, it nice. The singer of a band called really red. And I can't remember the name of the store. It was either Really Red Records or I think it was just Red Records. Okay. Okay. And they were, was, they had all the punk stuff. And that one lasted for a while and eventually failed as many do. Was that was that in Houston then? Yes. Okay. Okay. Nice. You know, drawing, you know, a little bit of the, the inspiration with being in record stores, does do, do any records come to mind as far as, you know, walking in and just seeing the cover art and being like, you know what? I don't know anything about that, but that's, that's the one. Do you, you have some records that come to mind from that? Not really, but I remember the first time I went into Red Records and there was um, some bands that were on my mind, but I'd never seen their records before. Oh, but I knew the names of the bands, so I went in looking for those. And one was TSOL, yeah. Two Sounds of Liberty. So they had Dance With Me there, and I found it. I was like, all right, cool. And I went to go buy it in the... The guy who ran the store, it was his store. Like I said, he was the singer of a punk band. He tried to talk me out of it, saying they were just uh, like a Hollywood version of The Damned. And I guess he was trying to steer me towards The Damned instead of TSOL. <laughs> I wanted TSOL, and I still liked them better than The Damned. So I think I made the right choice. <laughs> nice. Uh, it's a, that's kind of, you know, that, that, that kind of brings out like a funny point, you know, too, of like going to like a record store and, you know, having cats that are like, nah, man, you don't want this. Check this shit out. And it's like, no, I didn't come for that, man. This is what I want. Oh, he was totally, yeah, he was, to he was totally like that. Uh, oh, yeah. One other funny story about that store is we started going there more often. You know, once we found out where it was, we would drive there every now and then, check it out. So when DRI first made our, our first demo tape, it was just a cassette tape. We bought a, a box of blank tapes and we made our own copies or whatever. I think they were a dollar each or something, but we sold them for $2. Okay. And I made a, uh, to sell them, we didn't know where to sell them. So we took them to that store and he, the guy didn't really want them, but we said, you know, it's consignment, you know, you don't have to pay anything. We'll just leave them here and we'll come back in a couple of weeks and see if you sold any. So he was like, well, all right, you know. <laughs> But uh, the box that we gave him to sell them in was a, an old tissue Kleenex box. Okay. And I made, you know how the opening is kind of a football shaped opening mm -hmm. where you pull the tissues out? Well, I, I was in art school at the time, so I decorated the whole thing that looked like a giant vagina. <laughs> you had to reach your hand into the vagina to pull out the, the tape, and he thought that was pretty funny. But he got the little <laughs> box right there by the cash register and we came back, you know, in a week or two and sure enough, he'd sold some and wanted more. Damn. That is, you know, that, that's a, that's a, a perfect example of, you know, just a little bit of an extra push, you know, a little scheme behind it. Like, 
what the fuck? Is, what is that? <laughs> you might but it's funny, throughout, you know, throughout our career, we always, we always um, encountered resistance like that. Whenever we came into a do-it-yourself type store, or even when we had our seven-inch records, you know, and they immediately wouldn't take them, you know, and then we would just have to push them on them and say, well, leave them here. And then if you sell them, you sell them. And, and they always sold them. And we'd come back and be like, hey, guys. And all of a sudden, they're our best friend, you know. And they realized people, <laughs> well, they didn't like us. People actually did like us. Damn. Wow. That That is awesome. I mean, that that's funny, too, yeah, because it, 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 you know, drew attention that, you know, might not have necessarily. That's kind of a thing along, you know, with like cover art as well, you know, is that it might not something, you know, it might not be something you would regularly picked up. But then you see, you know, something that catches your eye. You're like, oh, shit, what the hell is this? I got to check this out. That's All right. And then there's perfect. other bands that supposedly the album kind of failed because it was a good record, but the cover art sucked. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a maddening circle, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every time we come out with a record, which hasn't been for a while, but you know, I really was uh, concerned about the cover art, wanting to make sure it was something that might catch somebody's eye and that we could also use for a T-shirt design and all that. Yeah, hell yeah, okay. Plus, and, it needs to, you just need to be able to see the art and then kind of consider what the music's going to be like inside there as well. The, Right, right. I love that. Are, are there any bands, you know, as far as you, you know, being a fan, even today that you follow that, you know, if they come out with something new, you know, tomorrow, you would go and pick up? Not really. No, okay. Not really. I mean, the, the last band that I heard that really caught my ear, you know, from the very beginning was Ghost. And uh, Ooh, yeah. even that I've kind of gotten tired of, but it was just something you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, it just sounds like this band and this band and this band all put together. And I'm like, yeah, but those are all bands I like. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they put it all together, just like DRI put certain things together. And uh, probably most people could tell and be like, yeah, but I like those bands. So, yeah, for sure. Kind of thing. But if okay. Ghost, each time they come out with a new record, I'm definitely interested in hearing it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Now, as far as, you know, with heavy music, lots of times, you know, there's kind of a crossover into, you know, the skateboarding world, the BMX world. And I wanted to touch on a little bit uh, with the, uh, with the shop beer city skateboards and records. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Old school, do it yourself, um, skateboard and record company. Mm -hmm. We're label mates on there with MDC and verbal abuse and a lot of other bands, Texas bands from back in the day. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. And now we're, um, the oh, owner helps us, helps us out a lot, putting right. our uh, re-releasing catalogs, uh, stuff we get back from other record companies, and it's pretty cool. Is, helps now, us, is, helps it, us with merchandise and all that. Okay. And that, that's not a company that you're involved in then, as far as like from like starting it up or anything like that? No, we're not. Okay. Okay. I, I, was, I was trying to find online and there was a couple of things that kind of led, you know, a little bit to that way, but I wasn't sure as far as if that was something, you know, but it's there's something that you guys, you know, have, have merchandise available and you have vinyl and different things like that. Yes. Okay, cool. Nice. It, it, it is just supplied while we're on the road and everything, you know, hell Make yeah, sure we have, cause our stuff's hard to find in the stores <clears throat> from what people say. Yeah. So it's great that we have it. Uh, at our shows because people are like oh cool i've been looking for this cd for a long time and you know nice gives me nice. a chance to snap it up yeah for sure now as far as did you know yourself with you know being into aggressive heavy music and different things did you ever get into skateboarding or bmx or anything like that yeah i was definitely into skateboarding before punk rock um even though i'm from texas i have family in california so as a kid every summer we would go to california and here everything's flat, but in California, there's hills all over the place. So it was a lot more fun and dangerous. So, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, my brother and I would always be skating around. We had old Alva boards and, you know, we'd go to some oh, um, sure. skate parks there, stuff like that. Okay. Do you, do you have a, a particular favorite board, you know, that you, you were just in love with that you kept for years? Uh, my old Alva board, okay. which I ended up selling to the... The guitar player of MDC had a had a skateboard uh, shop in San Francisco for a while, Concrete Jungle. Oh, and yeah. one time I was out living there, homeless. So I was out of money, and I sold my board. He didn't want to buy it, but one of the guys working there said, "Yeah, this is like maybe worth something someday," because mm -hmm. it was an, probably an early '70s Alva board. So oh, sold damn. it for a few bucks and get some food. 
Yeah. That was well, it. Bummer, because that, that'd P&D be a sick board, board to have. <laughs> yeah, I have DRI boards and Pasadena Napalm Division boards, so that's good enough for me. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. As far as you guys, like, that's one of kind of the merch things that you guys have, is you guys have your own, like, custom boards and whatnot. Was that kind of the inspiration behind it? Was you being uh, into skating, you know, younger? Uh, probably, but I mean, just, we lucked out getting on a, on a label. It's also, um, also a skateboard company. Yeah. So they had, <laughs> all, they had all different, they have all different sizes of the boards. And, and I told them, you know, I bring them on tour, but I'm like, this one particular one sells the best. So now we just bring those, I think it's oh, the okay. 80s deck or something. It's wider, okay. wider than the others. So yeah. It seems to sell better. Sweet. Okay, nice. You know, and touching a little bit further on that, you know, as far as with DRI's music, how did it come about that you guys had tracks featured in video games like the, the Tony Hawk, American Wasteland, and then Grand Theft Auto? How, how did that I happen? I think that just fans uh, that are doing it, you know, whoever he's Tony Hawk's probably just putting certain people in charge and say, pick a bunch of bands and give them their money, you know? So okay. we were supposed did to be have- on... Uh, ch- ch- the new Grand Theft Auto last coming out either soon or already out, but they had messaged me last summer and said we were going to be on there. And then I messaged them back in just last December and they said, Oh, you didn't make the cut. So I'm like, dang it. Oh, I really can't use the money right now, but yeah. <laughs> right. right. Uh, did, uh, have you played either of those games? Are you, are you, are you somebody who plays video games? The Tony Hawk one I had played. Yeah. Bef- uh, even with my son before we were ever on there. Nice. So then I was excited, you know, to tell him that we were on there. He's like, no way, really? Because, you know, he grew up playing that. But no, I've never played uh, Grand Theft Auto. Watched oh, okay. a little bit. Yeah, you I know, know what it is and everything. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's cool because, like, that was one of those things where it kind of shared those subcultures, you know, between, like, heavy music and, and fast punk and different things where, you know, you'd play those games, too, and it would introduce you to stuff that, you know, you might not have necessarily known, you know, like, I had already heard of you guys, but as far as like some friends are like, oh man, what's this song? It's like, you got to check it out, right. man. They've got a whole album of shit that slaps just like that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I got turned on to some bands uh, on that also. There's another uh, skateboard um, game we were on called Skate. I think oh, Skate really? 1 or okay. Skate 2 or something like that. I think we were on there too. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, I mean, we've had a whole history of just lucky little things that have kind of helped us <laughs> on our way, you know, like Slayer wearing our shirt or us being on video games or, um, you know, Dave Grohl liking DRI, just like, you know, lately, uh, was it Moby, the famous DJ guy? He's wearing yeah. DRI shirts a lot. Oh, and no kidding. Little wow. things like that have to just kind of keep keep it going, you know what I mean? Like keep it up, keep yeah. uh, keep our name out there. Right. I, I mean, along with the, the DIY mentality, it always helps, you know, as far as having ha- having some, some words still out there, having some people wearing some shirts and shit like that. So that's sweet. Definitely helps it keep going. I mean, we've been touring pretty steadily until last year mm-hmm. um, for about the last 10 years. And it just seemed to keep getting better, a little better and better every year. So All right. even without well, a new album. So um, it was looking up for us. It has been looking up for us for pretty much our whole career until now. So I can't wait to get back on the road. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. You know, that's one thing that I've, you know, I, I play in a band and we play shows and whatnot. But as far as like touring consistently, you know, that's one thing where it's just like, man, I cannot imagine like some of these bands that have been out for years and years. You know, it's like, fuck, what do I do now? I got to sit here and just hang out at home. Like, I'm not used to this shit. <laughs> yeah, well, the whole thing was, it wasn't like, okay, you're going to be out of work for two years. It was more like, oh, you're going to be out of work maybe till the summer. And then it was like, now it ain't going to be, you know, until next year. And then now they're, you know, Spike uh, guitar player just keeps on postponing the tours. And now it's looking like uh, next year, you know, 2022. But who knows? What are you supposed to do? Just keep waiting around. It was nice to have a little break at first. Uh, Yeah. Antsy. Sitting around scratching your ass. Like, what do I do now? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'm writing lyrics and doing things, but... um, artwork and stuff like that but it's still i want to get back out on the road again okay. i'm wondering what it'll be like if it's ever going to be like it used to be or if it's going to be like i've heard of, what is it new york opening places at 10 percent capacity stuff like that you know it's just yeah that's, that's not new, a whole, whole lot even for bands you know, coming through 
you only have that's that couple of people coming in, you know, that's, 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 uh, that's tough. Have you been doing writing at all as far as like with, with like your, your books and everything like that? Have you been working on anything new with that? No, not really. No. Okay. All right. And then with, with your, with your art, you've been just doing some, some painting and doing different like uh, projects or anything, or have you been doing anything? Yeah. Like, drawing and painting and stuff when I feel like it. Okay. Nice. Just having fun with it and keeping, keeping relaxed. Yeah. Nice. What is the, so as far as early on, you know, before, let's say even DR with, you know, joining up with bands and whatnot, what was kind of the process when you were first coming into, you know, being a fan of music and then, you know, kind of incorporating yourself into playing in bands? Hmm. Well, never expected to be in a band. <laughs> and I was um, going, I had gone to school in Mexico, art school. And when I came back, I was just kind of, not sure what I was going to do. Started art school in, in the United States in Houston again, just kind of floating around, you know, that age when you're uh, not quite sure what you're going to do in the, for the rest of your life. And my mm -hmm. brother had picked up the drums and he had, a, he bought a drum set from a friend who had been playing drums in high school, but had migraine headaches. So he had to sell his drum set because it, it would kick in the migraines or something. Oh, damn. So my brother didn't play, but he was like me, going to the same concerts, you know, liked the same bands, had just gotten into hardcore and punk and stuff, mm -hmm. and started out, like, learning how to play by himself, just playing along to ACDC and stuff. <laughs> and I'd always been writing lyrics, or poems, I called them. And everybody was like, yeah, yeah, you should be in the band, you know, because first I didn't really think that I could, but then once I heard hardcore, I'm like, oh, anybody could do that, especially when I <laughs> Went to some shows, you know, and I'm like, you know, he's just up there screaming and stuff. I could probably handle that. So, yeah, yeah then we started practicing with a couple other guitar players, but it was just awful. I mean, we couldn't really play or anything and, <laughs> and until we got Spike, and he was the one that actually had the talent and all that and kind of, yeah. you know, started coming over every day and working on songs and, and trying to get it together. Okay. At first, okay. I had um, – my style was uh, – I had an English accent, so I guess okay. I'd been listening to Johnny Rotten too much or something, or <laughs> too many English bands, but yeah, my fir the first few demos and songs that we recorded, if it makes me laugh if I listen back, because I did have an accent. <laughs> oh, songs that like I Don't Need Society were slow and English. <laughs> oh my, is that out anywhere? Like, is, there, is that leaked, like on YouTube or anything? Not sure, I have to, I have to go back. Um, oh, if it man. is on anything, it would be on the the re-release from Beer City because they did a lot of our demos. They oh, put them on okay. there for the Dirty Rotten LP and dealing with it has like tons of extra songs, That's first true. interviews we ever did, all that kind of stuff. Sick, very radio very cool. interviews, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we little by little we started playing faster, so we would start out the songs slow and then gradually play them fa as fast as we could and still keeping it tight. Yeah. So it took right. a lot of practice If people were wondering, like, how do y'all play so fast? And, you know, all stop and start at the same time. It's like, well, we practiced it until we could get it as fast as we could and then <laughs> could go no faster and still stay tight. Okay, shit. That, that, that's cool. I, you know, and it's one of those things, even with like a song, I mean, one of your bigger tracks, but Violet Pacification, you know, as far as like first hearing that track, you know, and it goes from so fast to all of a sudden, you know, slow to slower and then back fast again, you know, like, what the hell? Like, how are they, how are they doing this? You know, initially on that first listen or something like that, it was a, it was definitely a unique attack, uh, right. you know, on, on the, on the rhythm of the song. So yeah, that, that's, that's cool. I like a lot that. of rehearsing. Um, <laughs> yeah. We had very good work ethic. Nice. For sure. Nice. What can, do you, do you remember any sort of like maybe even a time frame or a couple of the, you know, the first shows where you started realizing like, shit, we might actually have something here and, you know, might be able to take this on a little bit more right it took us a while because we were one of those local bands where once we started playing we would get a lot of shows um in the first year because we were available and you know whenever a band would come through town they'd just throw us on there because we'd play for a six pack of beer or something like that sure so usually there weren't very many people at the shows um but eventually you know other musicians local musicians started coming to us and saying man I, you know i was listening to you guys outside when you guys were inside and you guys sound like a real band i mean like you know you could really be something and so little by little like that but 
even when we went on to move to California and all that, I really wasn't quite sure. It just seemed to me like people were just pretending to like us, like make us feel good or something. <laughs> but I remember the time when Spike, we had gotten stickers made. Somebody made stickers for us, little round skanker stickers with our, you know, our Running Man logo. Mm -hmm. And we went to a concert at the Mabuhay Gardens in San Francisco. Some other band was playing. And Spike handed me a pile of stickers and he took a pile of stickers. And back then you went around, you just stuck them places, you know, where people could see them. And he came around to me after, you know, we met up again after in the middle of the show or something. And, and I said, you know, you've been putting stickers out. And he said, yeah. He goes, every time I come back, they're gone. So people were stealing our stickers. And that was the first oh, time I realized okay. maybe people really do like us or they just like <laughs> the, the logo or something. I don't know. Okay. Nice. So what, what concert was that? It wasn't our show. It was just some gig in San Francisco we went to. Oh, okay, okay. I, I was just wondering as far as if it was like a heavier like music or something, like where maybe they, you know, had, had recognized the logo and they're like, hey, you know. That was probably a punk, this. local punk show, just a local punk. Yeah, I mean, there was people there. Like I said, I wasn't quite sure people really liked us. Yeah. <laughs> but one time I remember I was sitting outside of a show. We were on tour with uh, COC. Because it's easy when somebody comes up to you at the shirt booth. Oh, you guys are great. I love you guys. You know, but because they're probably not going to come up and say, you guys suck. Well, well you know, <laughs> punk show that could happen, but it rarely happens. <laughs> but I was kind of hiding one time, like sitting in our van and with the window down and nobody could see me. And two guys came over and were taking a piss outside of a venue or smoking a joint or something. And I heard them talking amongst themselves and about how great DRI was and how they loved DRI. And that was one of the first times when I realized, okay, they're saying it. They don't know I'm here. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Okay. Like Sweet. I love that. That's awesome. You know, as far as, you know, we kind of touched on cover art a little bit, you know, I wanted to bring up Craig Holloway. How did he get involved as far as with your Pasadena Napalm division EP and right. LP, correct? He did the, the artwork for both. Um, I, the EP, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at it again, but um, probably. Yeah, he's just a friend of ours, been in bands with Felix, our old drummer. Mm -hmm. uh, he probably knows the guys from Dead Horse. Mm -hmm. He did a DRI poster. I don't know if you ever saw it before for the 80s lineup tour we did a while back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Nice. And he doesn't, you know, and he didn't even ask us or anything. It's just like, hey, I did this art for you. And it's like this amazing stuff. And that's how he is. He just kind of. <laughs> Yeah, here you go. You know, he probably, it's like he came up with it in 10 minutes or something. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, so of course we went to him to ask him for the uh, the P&D album cover. Sweet. And we didn't give him an idea. He just came up with that and we're like, sure, good deal. Yeah, he's oh, an amazing, okay. amazing artist, very cool guy as well. Okay. I was going to ask as far as if there was any sort of inspiration or anything, that, you know, ideas, but he just threw that right together and was like, hey, what do you think of this? And that was that was it. Yep. Sick. That rules. Let me ask you as far as, you know, if, if you guys, you know, let's say next month you were going out and you scheduled a, a couple of shows or whatnot, and you, you were, you were going to do a show with DRI, and you could have any three songs in the set list that you wanted, what three tracks would you put in the set list? Yeah, okay. I think it would be, we play most of the ones I like anyway, but uh, yeah. if we could <laughs> Silent Spring, the one I did with... Um, Oh, Robot yeah. With Dave Grohl. Shit, we okay. played in the Pasadena Napalm Division set, and it's fun to do, and um, but we've never done it with DRI. I mean, DRI has so many of our own songs that we need to, that we can't even play because we don't have time. Yeah, right. We're an hour and a half set, and most bands of our type only play for like 45 minutes. Yeah. So we're already doubling what, what many bands that are our type of band the length of, of set that they do. And so you can imagine if they, especially since our songs are so short, even if we played 45 minutes, we'd be playing more songs than most of those bands. Right. <laughs> right. Like double that. So it's probably like triple of what a, of some other band. <laughs> so to add on another one that's, you know, the spike that wasn't even involved in is probably impossible. And I've asked him before. So Silent Spring is a uh, Probot song. Uh, Man Unkind is one we have not done in a long time. Oh, yeah. uh, from the Four of a Kind album. I like that one. Nice. Uh, all these are, you know, each time you come out with a new album, it's 
you go to see a band that has a new album out, they usually play a bunch of songs from the new album and then they play the hits from the other records. Mm. And then, you know, a couple of years later when they come out of the new album, they might only be playing one or two from that one that you saw a few years back. Yeah. The very best of those. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we don't do Man Unkind anymore because there's other songs, I guess, more popular from that album. Okay. Money Stinks is an, uh, one that we have not yeah. played in a long time. So that would be fun, even though it's a very short song. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Three. Awesome. I, I love that. I love that. Now, you know, over the years of touring in just countries and states and just different places, have there been, you, do you have a couple of items, you know, right off the top of your head that, that pop out as far as, you know, something that's just too cherishable, cherishable to get rid of, you know, may it be t-shirts or records or just something that, you know, a, a friend had left you that you haven't seen since? A lot of, yeah, books sometimes, like Away from Voivod, the drummer, he gave me his book. Um, uh, Fat Mike gave me his book. Should have oh, got nice. him signed. I totally forgot. Uh, <laughs> from No Effects, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, mostly uh, the guys from MDC, the drummer and the singer, both gave me their books recently. We nice. went to it in, in, uh, in England. So... Yeah, stuff like that. Other, I, I bought. I hardly ever buy stuff when I'm on tour, like at truck stops and stuff like that. I'm one of the people that tries to save their money when they're on the road so that they can pay their bills when they're not on the road. But mm -hmm. I did buy this weird, large acrylic insect display at a truck stop in like Idaho a few years back. And it comes <laughs> in its own. It comes in its own briefcase, suitcase type thing. And it's this big block of acrylic. It probably weighs 20 pounds. And it's a display, like something you'd see in a museum with all these crazy insects in there, in the, in the um, acrylic plastic. Oh, it's clear shit. acrylic. And it's got like 100 bugs in there. Da the it's like a, like a display piece type thing? thing? What? It's like a display piece type thing? Yes. Well, I don't know where to display it. It's still... I just have it <laughs> tucked away in its box, you know, because I, it's just, it's a big thing. I was going to get a table made for it where it would be the tabletop and get oh, a table nice. base made for it. But then I never actually got around to it. I took it somewhere and the guy declined the job. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that, that'd definitely be a unique thing for uh, having guests over, you know, they go to sit down there drink. Like, what the hell? What is that? <laughs> Yeah, and I saw that in a truck stop, and I'm like, this is just weird to have in a truck stop, you know, and yeah. I had to buy it. Yeah, And nice. it was the last one I had. Even better, even better. You know, uh, tell us about, you know, over over the years, you know, with all the shows, the concerts you guys play, night after night for years there, uh, what what is your pre-show, you know, your your pre-show ritual, if you will? What do you, do you do, you do some stretching? Well, do you do some yelling in the back? I arrive at the venue before the doors open. So like half an hour before, and then I um, sell T-shirts all night until it's time for us to go on. And when it's time for us to go on, I just, usually there's, we have a band that tours with us, so I just give them a nod to keep an eye on my stuff, you know, and then I go up on stage, drink a few beers during the night while I'm uh, selling shirts. Sure. Okay. And I go, and then I come back, and I continue selling until everybody's gone and pack it up, off to the next gig. Nice. Okay. Do you drink before before playing shows? Yes, while I'm selling shirts. Oh, okay. All right. I, I know some people are kind of particular as far as like they they like to maybe have one before and then wait until after. Or there's other people that are like, man, I'm just gonna have as much as I can before and then uh, you know. No, I know. I, I pace myself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't want to get drunk, but you know, it's a, <laughs> sometimes I'm selling shirts for four to six hours or something before we even go on. Right. Okay. Do you, uh, you, you do any sort of like stretching or anything like that before to kind of get limber for being up there for as long as you guys are? No, stretching ain't going to help me. I've never <laughs> been very limber. <laughs> okay. Get up there and do it. Shit. <laughs> nice. Uh, t tell us as far as, you know, the next couple of questions, I had some stuff I wanted to ask about Pasadena, and I wanted to, you know, kind of just have some fun with it and, you know, uh, throw out some oddballs to you right there. Absolutely. That hat is fucking is sick. I love that thing. So let me ask you, if you were to share a hundred beers with a zombie, what three beers do you love too much to share? <laughs> None. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I do like, uh, I like some, 
uh, you know, I don't really have the money to go buy expensive beers right now or anything, but I do like sure. something like a chocolate porter, okay. uh, chocolate stout, stuff like that. Nice. Nice. All right. What, uh, what can you tell us about the, the track spell it out? You know, for, for obvious reasons, anybody that haven't heard it, the whole track, all of the lyrics are spelled out. So, you know, there's not an actual solid word in the song. What was your approach or idea with that track? Well, I mean, there's a, there's been other pop songs where they spell out respect or ABC, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. So just basically taking that further, <laughs> okay. trying to spell the whole thing out. And it just, it worked, you know. How long it did worked. it take to pace that out? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, we were, it took us a long time to write that album because unlike DRI who were, you know, we'd be like five or six days a week in the studio rehearsing and writing songs with Pasadena and Napalm Division. It was more like maybe two days a week or something. And because uh, everybody had regular jobs and all that, you know, and it, it wasn't like it wasn't a professional band like DRI where we had the money to uh, to not have to work and just, you know, do our music thing yeah so it was a different experience for me it's the only other band i've ever been in so right. just working with all different guys I, I was very set in my ways but there was no way i was going to change the way they did things right. so i okay. just had to settle into the long slow haul you know writing those songs and you know, i could barely rem it was so long ago i barely remember exactly how it, how it came out it may have been the music first and i was able to just put the uh the 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 letters in there like that to make it fit i really don't remember exactly how it happened <laughs> oh okay okay and, and i know i know some of the backstory but as far as how did that come about because you mentioned that was the only other band that you ever been in you know other than dri uh you know how did the opportunity right. come up well dri had stopped touring for a couple of years because spike was sick so i after just kind of sitting around for a year i got a job as a manager at a strip club here in houston Nice. And so I was there, and then one of the guys in in uh, Dead Horse contacted me and mentioned, you know, hey, you want to, like, start this project and everything. There was no name for it. And they said, we already have a couple songs. So I said, all right, well, come by the strip club. And they came by and talked to me and stuff. And then I listened to the song that they had, 100 Beers with a Zombie. And I'm like, yeah, I could do that, you know. So then we... I learned it and came in the studio and rehearsed it with them. And it ended up, uh, you know, it ended up clicking. So that was good. Okay. Did they write some of the lyrics for that too as well? Yeah, Along the lyrics were there and even, even how to sing it and everything. I think it had been oh, a song sure. for one of the guitar players' other band that they had written for that band but just never did anything with it. So okay. we decided, you know, they just said, here, this is how you sing it and everything, which was different for me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I could do that. And just skip that one step, you know, of having to figure that shit out. It already fits. So right. Nice. The timing okay. was a little weird for me. It wasn't my normal timing, and that was hard for me. But mm -hmm. besides that, it was all good. Nice. Okay. What? Uh, how did the name come up? That was a tough one, because we, you know, we were tossing around all kinds of names, and that was really hard. And uh, Pasadena Napalm Division was one that Greg, or one of the guitar players, he came up with because he lives in Pasadena, Texas. And they actually, during the Vietnam War, they had a napalm division, Dow Chemicals there, where they were making napalm for the war. Oh, so there wow, was an shit. actual sign at some point there that said Pasadena Napalm Division. So he had told me about it. His uncle or somebody had told him about it. And so he told me. And I, everybody liked the name, but I was worried that people would think, Pasadena, California, which is the oh. more popular Pasadena. So that was my only concern. But then, you know, we decided to go with it. And uh, that was it. Nice. Yeah, that, that, that rules. I, I, yeah, I could never find that, too. So I wanted to ask as far as where that came from, because uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, like a, a ring and tune. And w along with DRI, too, you can shorten it up. And, you know, if you want to throw just the letters on a T-shirt as opposed to the name, you can do that as well. It's a good look. Right. Because Pasadena, Texas is... Um, it's almost nothing but a bunch of huge chemical plants. Oh, okay. So it was natural that they would be making the napalm there. Uh, we used to call it Stinkadena. We, <laughs> every now and then we'd have to, as kids, you'd have to drive through there, you know. 
on the way to New Orleans or something, and it would stink. It's like, oh, it's stinking peanuts. <laughs> now they've cleaned it up. It doesn't smell bad anymore there. But, man, it was really bad for years. Yikes. All right. All right, last, I wanted to ask about, you know, with a track title like Murder the Bearded Lady Killer, I just wanted to ask yeah. about, you know, that track and maybe your approach and how Tony, you know, got involved with the track. Right. So we we were like just like writing the songs it was hard to get everybody together to go in the studio it's like we weren't all going to just go there and spend a week in austin recording everybody had to go to jobs and stuff so we'd have to like come in on the weekend and bring the guys in to do backups and then you know they could only stay for one day and it was it was rough and uh time consuming so we had had it all set up to do some backup vocals and one of the guys in the band canceled at the last minute he's like oh i can't I can't make it. Oh, and he okay. was the one that had the higher voice that we needed in there for certain songs for the backups. So um, he just said, I can't do it. You know, it's fucked. And we already had the studio booked and everything. So you got to pay anyway. So mm -hmm. then I called up Tony and told I like, dude, I'll fly you in, you know, to do some backups. And he said, okay. And then I said, I also have this other song, which our drummer had come up with the name murder, the bearded lady killer. <laughs> so we were all laughing about it. You know, it's like, um, I came up with some lyrics, two two whole separate sets of lyrics, which were pretty bizarre, just like the name. But I, never really, I wasn't hundred percent down with it. I just never like really liked it. I didn't want to try it and just be like, oh, you know, it sucks, but you know, we have to do it. So then I I told uh, Tony, I said, look, I'm gonna just let you write it, and he he just said, give me a few minutes or whatever, and he went up there with the song and a piece of paper and a pen and. And he came up with his own lyrics and I'm like, yeah, good, fine. And let him go in there and sing it while we were there. And that was it. Shit. Okay. Nice. That, I, that I really... gave up. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you just, you just have this one, do what you got to do. <laughs> but I, my, my song was just really weird. I mean, it was all like circus freak stuff, yeah. which I, I, I showed him my lyrics and then he kind of, you know, took it to a, another level or whatever. But mine, I remember one of my lyrics was, um, it was basically after the murder and then, you know, the police come and checking out the crime scene and stuff at the circus freak show. And, and they found uh, one hairy cheek between burger buns <laughs> on the table. Like the, the bearded lady, like somebody had cut one of her cheeks off and with the hair still on it and everything and then had it between some burger buns. So. <laughs> yeah, it was just pretty bizarre. <laughs> Oh my god! I mean, I, you know, I would say that would definitely fit, you know, with like a track like "All of a Sudden Dead." You know, that that would uh, I, I think that it would have uh, it would have fit even still if you would have went along with that. That's fucking funny. Oh my yeah, god! Right. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's hilarious. All right, lastly, let me. Uh, this this is the last question here, and then uh, you know I'm gonna give you a little time here. I just wanted to ask you as far as you know, with, with you being a collector and a fan of guns, all right, I wanted to ask if you could manufacture any pistol or rifle with any company, you could make your own Kurt Breck line, you could, you know, do whatever specs that you wanted, what would the gun be like? And what DRI song would you name the line after? Well, I'm a revolver guy. So I, I really like okay. uh, Smith and Wesson revolvers. Nice. Okay. And the only problem with them now is that they all have a little lock on the side. Um, I think that they were bought by some company that makes the locks is what I'd heard. And so the old ones don't have the lock. So those are better as far as collectors go and all that. And the new ones look similar, but they have this stupid little lock on there. And <laughs> I know you can have that lock removed and all that, but it's still, so I would um, Smith and Wesson would be, my go-to company, but I would have a pre-lock gun made. Uh, there's a model that's called the model 27, which is their fanciest, most badass gun. Of course the new ones suck because I don't know, they're just kind of slapped together and the old ones I were hand polished and, you know, very nice and right. um, done by people that cared and all that. And now it's just all probably like CNC machined and, slapped together with a lock on there and everything so yeah i would get a model i would get a i would make it like a pre-model 27 because before they had the model numbers they had the gun and it was called something else like the combat magnum and oh, okay. then they later they changed it to the model numbers 
So I would either have like a pre-model 27 or an early model 27 um, nickel plated or blued three and a half inch barrel. Oof, oof, and and uh, I have nope. one. I have I have one myself already as as a collector. Oh, okay. Um, the model 27 three and a half inch. It's 27 dash two. They have the dashes after because they they make slight changes every now and then in the right. in the manufacturing process. So. Yeah, so that's uh be something like that. And then I would call it the dead meat. <laughs> oh my god. That would be sick. That would be awesome. As, especially for a, for a, a line of guns, the old dead meat. That <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> that would rip. That'd be awesome. Maybe I, do I, the maybe even do the pinto version. I don't know if you know what that is, but where people people make them for themselves. So, let's say you get a gun that's all blued, you know, dark color. Yep. But you take a, uh, a stainless uh, cylinder or in barrel and you put those on there. So you take the black uh, cylinder and the black barrel off and switch it out with the, the um, nickel plated ones. Ooh. So they're like half black, half silver. Yeah, it's called, okay. it's called a pinto. So maybe something like that just to make it a little in more interesting. Yeah, okay. Visually, the, the aesthetics there. Right. Okay, nice. That, how how long have you been have you been collecting since you were younger? Only like, since like 2010. Okay. Once I got in with the guys from uh, Pasadena Napalm Division, and they had a gun club. We got a gun club going at that time. So you had to buy, like, say, a shotgun to be in the gun club. And then I started, you know, once they told me, they're like, yeah, in Texas, you know, you can just buy and sell guns without, you know, anybody. There's no registration or anything, and it's legal to buy a gun off somebody and sell it to somebody else and all that. And I just said, huh, okay. And so I started getting into that and researching and all that. And then I started buying and selling guns like crazy for a while. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you have some, I mean, you, you might've just mentioned the one, but you know, some that are, are, are you know, too, uh, too cherishable or mean too much that you, you won't get, uh, get rid of. I, yeah, I, I have my hierarchy, I guess you could say like the, the last ones that I would get rid of. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of my buy just to sell. So oh, I, I okay. just see a good deal and I know I could sell it for a little bit more. So I'll buy those. But yeah, like that model 27, three and a half inch. Mm -hmm. I will, that'll be the last one that I sell if I have to. Oh, okay. I've sold quite a few during this pandemic, but those were ones that I had bought to resell anyway. Right. So okay. I need to get into my actual collection, but I got a few more I could get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not be, crying, not be crying about it. <laughs> Okay. Do you do like mods with them too, or do you do anything as far as, or are you kind of, you know, a guy that? No, likes I try to keep them original. Original. Okay. Nice. Nice. All right. Cool. Well, look, man, this is this has been our time. Uh, I don't want to go over, you know, the hour that I requested. This has been absolutely amazing, uh, and and such an honor, you know, to be able to have you on. This has been so so sick. This is your opportunity, though, if you want to let everybody know, you know, what you have going on, or you know, just give a shout out or something like that. This is uh this is this is your time for the floor, my man. I'm just looking forward to getting back on the road and playing live again. And I know from seeing people on Facebook and Instagram and everything, the the fans are itching to get back out mm -hmm. as well. Support your local musicians, record stores, whatever, you know, everybody's hurting right now. The whole live music business and everything is it's uh something none of us really ever expected, right? Yeah, yeah. And like I said, there wasn't any, like, it wasn't like at the beginning. We did two tours last year before we got cut off. We did Hawaii and um, South America. And then, you know, while we were in South America, you could just see it all ending, like all coming to oh. an end, you know. We were lucky to get out of there and get back to the United States. That was at the, the beginning of the great toilet paper hoarding uh, <laughs> deal. And everybody's like, bring toilet paper back with you from Chile and everything. You know, it was that bad. It was like we didn't really know what to expect, you know, it was, it was crazy. But Damn. then you had Trump saying it will hopefully be over by Easter and other people saying no, not till the summer. And then look at it now, you know, here we are. Yeah. Yep. No, now they're saying there may never be a normal. It might just be different versions of Corona. And then it's like, you have to have a book of all the, you know, 20 different uh, shots that you've gotten just to be allowed into <laughs> to Germany to do a show or something. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, I, I hate falling into everything too, as far as, cause I mean, it's just the same old bullshit that everybody talks about, but it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, where does it end? You know, I mean, you'd mentioned that earlier too, you know, where it's like, where, where do you just kind of try to, you know, pick back up and, you know, start shit up again? Cause it's like, you know, right. is it just going to go saying forever? Mask wouldn't work. And then they're like, mask does work. And now they're saying <laughs> double mask, double mask <laughs> works better, but still not all that good. And so it's like, fuck, yeah. they just keep changing shit. By they, you know, I mean the the doctors or whoever, the politicians, the media, et cetera. Yeah, who yeah. What to believe? Yeah, who? And that's that's one of those things. I mean, we won't we won't get too much into that, but you know, I, that is, you know, like you mentioned, as far as like touring musicians, even the roadies. You know, that's one thing too that I've seen. You know, some bands, you know, kind of backing up on. You know, where it was like that was their livelihood. You know, and maybe that that might not even be the cats that you thought about. You know, the ones that are building up stages or setting up, you know, like instruments, different things like that. You know, it's, it, it affects the shit out of so many people, you know, and it's like, where, where do we start kind of trying to pick yeah. back up and trying this again? Everybody, the company, what about the companies that rent out their PA systems and, the, there and the lighting systems and the stages they build and everything. It's just, everything's fucked. Yeah. Um, yeah. D before like other times that the United States had, uh, decline i guess i don't know what you'd call it um problems like say 2008 and stuff like that people were affected financially and there's always been problems but the music w business was always just somehow above all of that like people mm -hmm. still went to shows no matter what what was going on mm -hmm. um in the stock markets and all in the jobs and everything it's we were seemed to be above all of that and now it's the exact opposite Right. And now, right. like, we were the first to go. It's like, oh, no, no more, no more gatherings. Yeah. Won't have any more of that. And, you know, no more of that shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, who, who knows? Well, we'll see. You know, all I can say. Uh, and, and real quick, if you could pitch as far as, you know, like, where can people find uh, DRI records? Where can people find PND records online? What are some shops, you know, that they can go if they're watching right now? The DRI records, uh, I would get those from Beer City Skateboards and Records. Okay. Pasadena Napalm Division, you can get from uh, the record right now, what they're called. But I know they've still got some. Okay. All right, cool. I know I, know I picked up uh, one that was off of the, the band's uh, band camp. I can't remember what exactly what page that it directed me to, but yeah. um, it must I got be, It must be that. Yeah, it must be the record company. Yeah, small okay. company. Like I said, I haven't really looked at that lately. I can't remember. Yeah. I just woke up like an hour before, before uh, I slept, overslept or whatever. So an hour before we did this thing, so I didn't have time <laughs> yeah. to get everything ready like that. Well, man, you were you were prepared. I, I absolutely appreciate it. And and uh, I'm gonna leave you off with this. This is uh, the the finale. I wanted to ask you as far as if a director was coming up and they approached you about making a biopic for DRI, they asked. Kurt, who would you want to play you in this biopic? Who, who, what <laughs> actor, what, or musician? Who would you want to play Kurt Brecht? Well, see, a there's a young, a young, young me, a middle-aged me, or an older me. I got to have three different guys, or what? There you, sure, uh, there you go. If you're up know. to it, <laughs> me living in the tree. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> how about Johnny Depp? I don't know. There, you, there you go. A man of many talents. He can pull off all sorts of shit. Absolutely, that'd be a good one. I like it. Sweet. All right. Look, that uh, that was just something I wanted to leave off with, have a little fun with. Uh, you know, hopefully something like that happens because you guys have been such a, a quintessential uh, member to the metal and thrash community. Uh, you know, and, and like I say, I appreciate it. And I hope everybody watching goes and buys, you know, some merch or or uh, you know something from the band because uh, these bands really need it right now and uh, they deserve it. You know, DRI PND. Absolutely. Love them. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, man. Thank you so, so much. Uh, you take care. This will be edited and posted on you on my YouTube page later this week here. Um, I'll send you a link and whatnot too. So, uh, but yeah, this is, uh, this is wrapping up here. I really appreciate your time. As I, as I said before, thank you so much. Uh, putting up my, my shenanigan questions and different things. <laughs> All right. Thank you too, man. Right, everybody. Lo-fi horror guy. My dude, Kurt Brett. You guys take care. Stay safe. Later.
See ya. Dun, 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 He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi, a horror guy. Yeah, baby.